The Game Boy was a primitive console, but still won against other handhelds despite them having superior hardware. Better hardware does not mean a better console. But one company had a much different approach with their handhelds. You've probably never heard of this thing. Does it hold up against the Game Boy, and why was it created in the first place? Let's take a look. What's going on? It's Poger coming at you with another video. Alright, so if you've seen a couple of my videos and you like what I do, hit that subscribe button right there. So we have this thing called YouTube Studio and I recently checked my analytics and 85% of people who watch my videos are not subscribed. Not hating on it, but if you got a second, hit that subscribe button right there. And check out our Discord server, discord.poja.net. I'll also put a link right in the description. Anyway, let's talk about the Mega Duck. While the Game Boy was an excellent handheld console, there were some areas of improvement. The games were in black and white and there was no backlit screen. But none of this seemed to matter because the Game Boy had a fantastic lineup of games. The console was bundled with Tetris which greatly contributed to its success. The Game Boy would receive its own version of classic NES games like Super Mario Land, Operation C, Mega Man, and others. But still, Nintendo's competitors would recognize the weaknesses of the Game Boy and try to capitalize off them. The company Epix was already working on their own handheld console even before the Game Boy, but when they went out of business, Atari Corporation would take over the project. What we got was the Atari Lynx. The console was technologically impressive. The games were in color and the console had a backlit screen, both of which went up to the Game Boy. A lot of games showed off some sprite scaling which was impressive for a portable console, but that's not the full story. The battery life was abysmal, only 4-5 to five hours. The price was too high at $180, and the library of games was lackluster. The Atari Lynx did not hold a candle to the Game Boy. Sega had a similar tactic with the Game Gear. This console had a backlit screen and could support color, just like the Lynx. But the Game Gear had a lower price and a superior lineup of games compared to Atari's console. However, once again, it could not beat the Game Boy. Sega's console had poor battery life, 3 to 5 hours, even worse than the Lynx, and was still too expensive. Both of these consoles beat the Game Boy in the hardware department. They got that part right. But better hardware does not mean a better console as you may know from my previous videos. The Game Boy had better games, was cheaper, and boasted a long battery life. So with all this said, if you're a competitor, how do you actually beat the Game Boy? Well, one company thought, if you can't beat them, join them. In 1993, a Hong Kong-based company called Wellback Holdings released the Mega Duck. This console did not try to use better hardware to beat Nintendo. In fact, the console's appearance and hardware closely mimicked the Game Boy. Both units were in black and white and had the exact same size screen. The CPUs were similar, both clocking in at 4 MHz. The memory was similar too. The Mega Duck had 16 kilobytes of RAM while the Game Boy had 8 kilobytes of RAM and 8 kilobytes of video RAM, although many cartridges contained expanded memory. Supposedly the Mega Duck is capable of parallax scrolling, but I was not able to find a single game that utilized it. The Mega Duck was picked up by other companies like Creatronic and Videojet and would be released in other regions as a result. In Brazil, the company Cougar USA would distribute the console in Brazil under the name Cougar Boy. Despite the name of the company, neither the Cougar Boy nor the Mega Duck ever came out in the US. Releasing this console in Brazil was actually a great idea because not many first party game companies were releasing their consoles over there. The Mega Duck would also be released in France, the Netherlands, and Germany. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of information on the Mega Duck and where the console was released. It might have been released in other European areas as well as China and Hong Kong, but I wasn't able to verify that. Very few developers got on board with the Mega Duck. Only three known companies developed games for it. One of them was Common, who made more than half the entire library of Mega Duck games. The other company was surprisingly Sachin. This was an unlicensed game company that developed numerous NES games. 
Their titles were a mixed bag. Some games like Mission Cobra were very low quality, but other games like Q-Boy were actually decent. This company could be a heavy hitter for the Megaduck. The creator of the Megaduck, Wellbeck Holdings, only developed one game for it. Can you imagine creating a console and only making one game? They probably had no faith in it. The Megaduck only has 24 known games, but there might be more out there. So if you're trying to compete with Nintendo, having a weak library of games and almost no third-party support is not the way to do it. But I don't think the Megaduck was trying to compete with Nintendo. I think the console was meant to piggyback off the Game Boy's success. They knew the console couldn't beat Nintendo, but maybe they could make a few extra dollars because it's similar. The Megaduck is more of a knockoff than a competitor. So with that all said, how are the games? Let's take a look. First we'll check out Arctic Zone. It's a puzzle game where you must draw a rectangular shape to make the blocks disappear. This game is obviously a clone of Konami's title Quarth. I'm glad that Megaduck received its own unofficial version, but unfortunately the controls are terrible. You cannot fire any ice cubes in rapid succession, and it seems like the game eats a lot of my inputs. The official Quarth had excellent controls. It's a fast-paced game, so you need fast-paced and smooth controls, but here it's slow and clunky. There's also no option for selecting what level you start off on. As soon as you leave the title screen, you're immediately brought to the game. This is not the best version of the game, but good that it's on the Mega Duck. Here's Second Space. This is one of the Sachin games. It's a Pac-Man type game where you color in all the spaces and avoid the enemies. When you color around all the empty areas, they rotate and reveal a background picture. I gotta admit, the music is great. My only complaint with this game is that when the empty areas rotate, the game freezes for a second. Why not just let the game keep going while the animation plays out? This is a decent game though. Now for Magic Tower. This is another Sachin title. You play as a hand and you must destroy every enemy in order to complete the stage. Whether you're able to kill the enemy depends on what your current hand gesture is and what theirs is. If you touch an enemy with the wrong gesture, you lose. The controls could be better. You can only jump straight up and you're not able to drop down to lower platforms. I feel like this would be more playable if you could. You also start off very slow, but there are items that improve your speed. This is a cool bubble bobble type game to have on the Mega Duck. Here's Zip Ball. You control a cursor on the screen and you must guide the ball to the finish line. If the ball touches an enemy, you lose. The ball can either bounce horizontally or vertically and you can change which direction it moves. The controls are lousy. In order to grab the ball with your cursor, you don't just line it up, you have to move in the direction of the ball while pressing a button. Even then, it's easy to let go of the ball by accident. Still though, it's an okay puzzle game. Here's the brick wall. Here, the enemy above will try to break the pieces of your wall and you must reinforce it. If the enemy makes a hole that extends from the top to the bottom, you lose. You have to be careful where you rebuild your wall because if you place too many blocks in the same spot, a darker color wall will appear. These darker walls will block you from everything behind it, so you must use your bomb to destroy it. This is actually a very complex game. It's hard to keep track of what's going on. The controls are very precise too. Your horizontal and vertical position have to be perfect in order to hit your target. When I saw the title of this game, I was expecting a breakout clone, but instead we got something original. It's an okay game. Let's check out Solomon's Treasure. You play as a snake who must collect all the dots to beat the stage. If you or your body touches an enemy, you lose. You do have an escape button that allows you to retract to the top if an enemy is near. It's actually a challenging game because it's hard to keep track of your whole body. When you think you're safe, suddenly an enemy appears and you have to move back up. This is a decent title. There's a lot of games that are clones of well-known titles. In the game Pile Wonder, you're supposed to move boxes to required locations without getting them stuck somewhere. Sound familiar? In Vex, you catch pieces from the air and drop them below. You can match three of the same pieces in a row and make them disappear. This is just a clone of Klax. In Puppet Knight, you drop bombs and make blocks disappear, which is similar to Bomberman. In Snake Roy, you collect pieces in order to extend the length of your character. We've seen this type of game a hundred times. To summarize the library of Megaduck games, there's a lot of early 80s style arcade titles on here. A majority of the games are a single screen and basic in nature. None of these titles pushed the hardware limits whatsoever. The Game Boy, however, received titles that were bigger and more groundbreaking. 
you definitely got more bang for your buck with the Game Boy. One genre I didn't see at all on the Mega Duck was platformers. Not a single one made it onto the console. The closest thing we got was Magic Tower. Why not? That would have been awesome. I'm also disappointed that Sachin didn't bring over some of their best games. There's a few NES games they could have remade. Hellfighter was a decent platformer that would have made an excellent Mega Duck game. Q-Boy would have been the perfect title to port over to the Mega Duck. Sachin may not have bothered because they knew the console wasn't going to be much. I wasn't able to find a lot of information about the Mega Duck, like how many were sold or when it was discontinued. In general, this was one of the most difficult topics to research because of the lack of information. The Game Boy was primitive but still had amazing games. Other companies tried releasing handheld consoles with better hardware, but it wasn't enough to beat Nintendo. The Mega Duck made no attempts to compete with Nintendo. Instead, they followed behind them and grabbed any remaining customers. Unfortunately, the Mega Duck would be nothing more than just a very obscure console. Hey, I just wanted to thank you so much for watching this video. If you made it this far, hit that like button. If you enjoy this type of content, hit the subscribe button for more content. Both of these things really help the channel grow. If you have anything to share, feel free to leave a comment. I read every single comment on this channel, and I'm pretty good at replying back. Anyway, have a good one.